This is CNN Radio. It's Saturday at 1 o'clock. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. This is the place where Utah's culture, history, politics, and religion collide. We tell you, as the intro music said, everything you never knew you wanted to know. We've talked a lot over the last few months about politics, about the presidential race. Super Tuesday's this this Tuesday, February 5th. As we've promoted a couple of times this week, and as I mentioned last week on the air, we have a guest with us from the FBI. Very happy to have him, Special Agent Larry Carr. He's with the Seattle field office, and he is investigating the D.B. Cooper case. On December 31st, 2007, the FBI reopened this case. I don't think it was ever really closed, but they put a dispatch on their website asking for more information about the case, asking people to help them solve it. Now, we've done three shows in the past on D.B. Cooper. We interviewed Rus- Russell Callum, another FBI agent who is, I think, in the Las Vegas field office during the hijacking, and then another author as well uh, about his identity, about the events that happened on that night uh, in 1971. Now, to give you just a little bit of background information, hopefully most of you are familiar with what happened and why we're discussing it on the air today. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time giving you the basics, but I'll give you 45 seconds worth. In 1971, I think it was November 24th, a 727, it was a Northwest Orient, Pacific Northwest Orient 727, I believe, and I'll ask Agent Carr to correct me if I'm wrong, was flying over the Cascade Mountains in Washington. It was hijacked by one of the passengers who called himself Dan Cooper. The media reported his name was D.B. Cooper. He ransomed the passengers, landed the plane. He only requested $200,000 in ransom money, which I think was more money at the time than it is now. The plane took off again. He, he also asked for four parachutes, claimed he was going to jump out of the plane with himself, a stewardess, the pilot and co-pilot, I, th- I believe, and he ended up opening a door on the back of the 727, jumping out of the plane himself. He's never been heard from again. Now, who was this guy? Why weren't they able to find him? Why is the FBI still interested in this case? Larry Carr is here to tell us. Now, he heads the FBI Seattle's. He's their bank robbery coordinator. He's got a degree from Florida State and a master's degree from St. Cloud State in Minnesota. Very capable agent. Uh, I'm sure, and the agent that's been assigned to to try and solve this case once and for all. So I want to bring him on now. Agent Carr, you're on the air. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, it's a real privilege to have you. I, well, we really appreciate you taking time out of your weekend schedule to be with us, and uh, we have a lot of in- listeners who are very interested in this case. I don't know why. I think people in Utah tend to be more interested in this case than you would expect, maybe because of the Richard Floyd McCoy connection that some people believe exists with the D.B. Cooper case. Well, you know, I, I think just in general, everyone loves a great mystery, and you know, by comparison, this may be one of uh, the greatest unsolved ones in, in American is, is there, history. Is there any other case the FBI is working on that that's as renowned as this one that remains unsolved after so long? Well, you know, I mean, there's there's hundreds of incredible cases that the bureau's working on, but you know, this is uh, this is kind of a strange one in its own category. So I, I would say, you know, this is the only one of its kind, absolutely. I have some very specific questions that I want to ask you about the dispatch that you put on the FBI.gov website about the case itself and and some other things. And I also want to allow our listeners the chance to speak with you if they'd like. So I'm going to throw out the phone numbers, and we may take some calls later in the program. In Salt Lake City, the phone number is 254-5855, Provo 470-5855, Ogden 670-5855. Now, Agent Carr, tell us, first of all, how did you get assigned this case, and how long have you been on it? Just like just like everyone else that's kind of interested in it, uh, I as an investigator looked at it and thought, "Wow, what a what a great opportunity!" And the agent that was assigned uh, to the case uh, was transferring out of the division, and I, I saw this as an opportunity to uh, to take it on. And, and I jumped at the chance. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, this thing is interesting, um, and uh, you know, I wanted to find out more about it and see if uh, if, if see if I could take a stab at uh, solving it. Well, I think you got a real good chance of solving this thing. It, the little bit that I know maybe more than some, there's so much evidence out there, it just seems like somebody ought to be able to put it all together. Now, let's talk a little bit about your, your dispatch. So you posted this dispatch on the FBI.gov website on New Year's Eve, on January th- or December 31st, 07, just, right. just a few days ago. In this, this uh, dispatch, you talk about the basics, uh, this Dan Cooper ransomed the passengers for 200000 The FBI has never been able to, to find him, but you did rule out several... Former suspects, I think Weber was one, 
and, and a few others. And I'm, I'm looking over the dispatch now. How did you rule out those suspects? Well, you know, you, you look at uh, the investigation. In fact, when you, you talk about suspects and, and how broad this investigation is, there's been uh, 1,057 individuals that uh, have been investigated in the 36-year history of it. And wow. uh, virtually every one of them, with the exception of a very few, uh, maybe a, just a small handful, uh, have been ruled out through the investigative process. Every, every division in the FBI was sent um, a list <clears throat> when, when they identified the subject of things to investigate uh, with regards to the evidence and who we thought or believed Cooper uh, might be. And just through that list alone, we were able to uh, eliminate folks. And then back in uh, 2000, the case agent uh, resubmitted uh, the, the tie that was left behind uh, by the individual uh, who, who, we, who, who was D.B. Cooper um, and submitted that back to Quantico, Virginia, and, and had DNA analysis done uh, on the tie, and they were able to uh, recover some from the tie. And so we went through and, and tried to find a list of subjects um, for, for testing. Uh, okay, and that's right. And for a while, the FBI didn't even acknowledge publicly that they had this tie. Is that right? That's correct. Well, that we had DNA. You had DNA evidence off the tie. And there's a picture of it on this dispatch you put up there. Now, we had on Russell Callum. I don't know if you know who he is. I, I, I think you told me you'd heard his name before. And he said that the FBI may, may also have uh, DNA evidence from cigarette butts left on the plane. Can you discuss that? Or do you have additional evidence in your case file that, that isn't for public disclosure? Well, you know, all, all the evidence that uh, it, there's pictures of, of all of it. And so uh, what is there has been released to the public, and, okay. and only that information will be really released. But you do have other information that is not being released. Well, you know, certainly with any investigation, you, you have to hold something back. Um, you know, if you put everything out there and then you have ten people that come forward and have all the information in the case, there's, it, it, it's hard to uh, make any validations of any statements that, that come forward. Getting into the case itself... This happened in no on November 24th, 1971, so 36, 37 years ago. To start off with, what do listeners need to know about the case? Maybe listeners who are interested in helping solve it. Well, you know, and, and, and that's the whole reason for all of this. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a misnomer to say, hey, the FBI is going back and reinvestigating this case and, um, and, and putting all this resource into it. It's always had a case agent. It's always been open. Um, the difference is is that now when I took on the case, I looked at it and said to myself, you know, you know, my core is bank robbery. That's what I investigate. And one of the foundations of a bank robbery investigation is to get as much public, uh, is get as much information out to the public as possible and then have them bring it back to you, have them bring the suspect to you. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, when you break this down to the baseline, it's nothing more than a bank robbery. It just happened to be on an airplane. He goes in, he makes a demand for cash, he gets his cash, and he leaves. Mm -hmm. So I said, we're going to treat this like a bank robbery. There's no reason for us to hold back information. And so the first step was getting a clear picture out to the public of who D.B. Cooper was or who we believe he is based on the information. And I think for a very long time, the public has been left with this image of D.B. Cooper that uh, special forces, you know, survival training, uh, skilled parachutists. But when you look at the events of the evening, the words he chose when he spoke, the actions he took, we came up with a much different picture that he wasn't an expert. He was one of those individuals that had just enough knowledge to be dangerous, and unfortunately probably a danger to himself in this case. I, so that I was saw the that first dispatch. Step. Okay, all right, and, that, and that's certainly a conclusion I haven't heard before. It's interesting to hear, to hear that, and, and it was interesting to read that on the website as well. So that was the first conclusion that you made, that he wasn't an expert parachuter. And it sounds like you think he probably died in the, in the skyjacking in the high, after he parachuted out of the 727. We, you know what? I, I think that is the most likely scenario. You know, when when you try when you look at the evidence in in general, um, from beginning to end, and the, the finding of the money and how the condition of the money was found, where it was found, how it was found, um, and, and you try to put it all together, and then you lump that in with, you know, this was a huge investigation uh, by the FBI, um, and, and for us not to come up with something, something uh, that leads us to believe that you know, yeah, he, he, he probably died. You know, bringing all those conclusions together. Now, who knows? Could be wrong, and he, he may be out there listening to this show right now, laughing, uh, and, and hopefully he'll decide to give me a call and have a conversation with me. Um, uh, but when you look at everything, the totality of it, you know, I think you come to the conclusion that that he probably did pass away, either you know from the jump itself or uh, trying to get out uh, with the money under the conditions, probably injured um, and uh, lost his life that night. 
Now, let me remind our listeners just of a couple of things. So he left a clip-on tie that we've just been discussing on the plane. And in 1980, a young boy found $5,800 and $20 bills from the hijacking on the banks of the Columbia River. And there's pictures of the bills here. They look like they're not in very good shape. But those are the only bills of the ransom money that was paid that have ever turned up. These bills that were on the banks of the, of the Columbia River. So this is another piece of evidence or circumstance in the case that leads you to conclude that he probably died because the money was never spent. Is that right? That's right. Or that we know of. That you know of. Would, is it likely you would have found the bills had they been spent? You know, it, it, it would have... The chances would have been greater if uh, he had spent the bills right away somewhere in the Pacific Northwest just because, you know, that uh, the focus of the investigation was here, everyone was hyper alert. Uh, but the reality of the situation is, is you could have spent those $20 bills anywhere, um, and, uh, you know, there's no mechanism in place to scan those numbers. So, you know, odds are, unless, you know, back in, in uh, you know, the 70s at some point in time and a, and a teller just happened to have a list of the, uh, the serial numbers, which they were provided, and then happened to do a spot check and found one, that's the only way we would have known. Now, let me play the devil's advocate here for just a second. Well, first of all, can you tell me that no, no other bills have ever turned up, right? Right. So he instructed the pilots to fly at about 20,000 feet, and he jumped out the back of the plane. Is that, is that right? Am I right on that? Uh, 10,000 feet. Oh, 10,000 feet. Okay. He jumped out the back of the plane. The stewardess, if I'm not mistaken says that he took the duffel bag with the ransom money and tied a cord or a rope around it and then tied the other end of that cord or rope to his waist and jumped out the plane. And so some people speculate or think that he had this military special forces training in part because he attached the money to his person that way, which I guess is a pretty standard way they they teach in in the Army of, you know, parachuting with equipment. You have it dangle beneath you five or ten feet. So you don't think that that suggests, though, that he had military training? Uh, you know, I think when you look at the totality of the situation that night, um, and, and certainly, you know, we can get into that, um, but I don't think that one piece, and, and we're not exactly sure how, from the statements, how he tied that around Is his that right? face. L- Larry, we have to take a two-minute commercial break. Oh, okay. Stay, stay with us. Listeners will be right back talking to Special Agent Larry Carr about the D.B. Cooper case. K.K. My boys are bored. They got me out there at quarterback, so I got a pain reliever for my sore joints. They even had me join their own little band. So I had to get a headache medicine, too. Different pains, different pain relievers. But not anymore. Today, I'm all Advil. Advil is my every pain reliever. Works wherever I hurt. And nothing's proven stronger on tough pain than Advil. So whatever hurts, I'm all Advil. Are you all Advil? Use as directed compared to OTC pain relievers. Investors, today's economic and political instability means it's more important than ever for you to create financial protection and upside potential. How can you do it? With an investment in gold. I'm Mark Alberian, president of Goldline, the nation's trusted source for gold and silver since 1960. Our clients have seen gold and silver more than double in the last three years, and many experts are predicting even greater increases. We make it easy for you to add gold and silver to your portfolio for as little as $1,000. I'm talking about real gold and silver, shipped to you with no sales tax or delivery fees. Find out how gold can protect you from inflation, a falling dollar, and world unrest. Call Goldline right now, and I'll send you a free investor's kit and CD. Call 1-800-TAP-GOLD, 1-800-T-A-P-G-O-L-D. Call Goldline right now for your free investor kit and CD, 1-800-TAP-GOLD, 1-800-TAP-GOLD. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. You're with Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio station, the voice of Utah, AM 630 K-Talk. We're talking about the D.B. Cooper hijacking case in 1971, famous unsolved case in, in American history. And we've got Special Agent Larry Carr from the FBI. He works in Seattle in their field office there on the line with us. Grateful to have him. Uh, we'll go to callers in a minute. We may kind of spread the callers out a little bit. Uh, if you feel like calling into the program, please do so. And we'll try to get you on the air. 254-5855 in Salt Lake. Provo 470-5855. Ogden 670-5855. Let's go back to Agent Carr. Agent Carr, sorry about that break. We have these things kind of pop up on us from time to time. Not a problem. So you concluded that 
Dan Cooper or D.B. Cooper did not have formal military training. Can you take us through everything that happened that night, piece by piece, and, and emphasizing the, the points that people ought to know, and, and then we can discuss them? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when, when I was pouring through these endless case files, uh, and uh, I found some great ones, you know, where they just totally stepped through uh, step by step that evening. And it really allowed me to kind of get into Cooper's shoes and, and his head and, and try to come up with, you know, a, a picture of who he was. What was his reasoning that night? And from that, you know, come up with a profile of who he was, more importantly, who he wasn't. And, mm-hmm. and that opens the door to the investigation. So when you look at the case, you, you have a guy that shows up at the Portland airport. And uh, you say to yourself, if this guy knew uh, or was skilled in skydiving, he would know what he's getting himself into. So you, you arrive there, and the weather's already bad, according to the, the gate agent. You know, uh, even some of the customers were concerned of, about the weather. And so, uh, you know, if he knew what he was going to ju- get into, uh, you know, if he had that military experience, he would know, wait a minute, you know, in the military you're going to scrub this mission because it does no good to jump out of the plane with, uh, with all your comrades only to have casualties when you hit the ground because now you're going to make the problem worse. Right. Um, so you're just not going to do the jump. You're going to do it another day. So yeah. right there tips me off. This says, wait a minute. He didn't really fully understand what he was getting himself into. Um, that's, that's true. Or maybe he felt he had some overriding pressure. Uh, it was the only night he could do it for some reason. Or he'd been planning it so long he didn't want to give up. Exactly. But it makes sense what you're saying. But you're right. So then, so then I say to myself, because he did go through with it, well, maybe he was a, a big expert, right? And uh-huh. he felt he had the expertise to pull this off. So he said, I don't care about the weather. I can do this jump. So he gets on the plane, um, you know, passes his, his demand note uh, to uh, the stewardess and sets in, in motion uh, what, uh, the, the hijacking and the, and the demands. And, and when you look at his demands, you know, he said, I want two back shoots and two front shoots. Well, now we can almost rule him out as a sport jumper because he would have said, I want two mains and two reserves if he was a sport jumper yeah. who had free fall experience. Now, that's interesting. Now, I, I don't know what a back shoot and a front shoot are. Well, you know, your main would be the, the shoot that's on the back, uh-huh. you know, and your reserve would be your, oh. your chest shoot. Oh, I see. Okay. But the terminology w- was wrong for a sport jumper. Uh, plus, you look at his age. Well, 1971, sport jumping was, was in its infancy. And so to have a guy that's 45 to 50 years old participate in the sport, I mean, today, that's common. But back in 1971, that would have been rare. So those two things right there kind of rule out the fact that he, he had a lot of freefall experience, which you're going to need on a jump like this because you're going to have to slow your body down. Okay. So from that, we can rule out sport jumper. Um, but then you say, okay, military, if he did have all this experience and he knew he was going to go into this, this uh, jump, uh, you know, he, he jumped at 200 miles an hour, basically 205 miles an hour from this jet, um, which is, uh, you know, double what the normal speed is, um, he doesn't, he doesn't make any requests for specific equipment. You know, if he had knowledge of this jump and knew what he was getting himself into and knew this was going to be a challenge, he could have named anything, uh, he could have asked for any equipment available, but he didn't. He made no specifics other than two back shoots, two front shoots. Um, and then also you look at his demand for the money. You know, if he had knowledge of the jump he was going to go into, he, he would have certainly asked for dollars that would have decreased the weight and bulk of the jump, so it was manageable when he jumped out at 200 miles an hour. That is because, interesting. That's, that's a good point. Because str- strange things happen at that, at that. And you can ask anyone that's jumped at a high rate of speed. I mean, it, it, it's hard to keep the helmet on your head you know, when it's buckled to it, uh, l- let alone uh, a big bulky strap money. So he got $20 bills. And so all this leads you to believe that he was an amateur, that he was not an experienced military parachuter. Well, here's what I think he was. I think he did work in the military. He worked on an aircraft, uh, maybe as a loadmaster. And so he had training about how to put the parachute on, obviously, because you're going to have an open door, uh, throwing cargo out. Um, And he probably saw halo jumpers jumping out, Um, maybe even did a couple static line jumps and thought, well, I've seen him do it. I know how to pull the ripcord. This is no biggie, but had never really done it. So, again, it goes back to one of those individuals that I think had just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Okay, now let me let me challenge a couple of your assertions, just to, uh, thoughts that come to my mind. Okay. Six months later or a year later, Richard Floyd McCoy pulled off a hijack, and it was very similar, exact same thing. Now, he, he was a, an experienced jumper, but he 
nevertheless didn't ask for this equi- equipment that you say an experienced jumper would have asked for. He jumped out the back uh, 10,000 feet, I think, and did it more or less the same way. So why, and he, I believe he also asked for $20 bills because he thought that they would be less easy to trace. So is it possible that that even an, ex- an experienced jumper would have proceeded this way? Well, you know, and of course, I, I, I'm not uh, by any means an expert on the McCoy uh, investigation. Um, you know, I do have some knowledge, and I believe, uh, and, and don't take me at 100% here, but I believe he brought his own equipment on board. He didn't ask for any shoes. He brought his own, which a sport jumper would, because they're very particular about their equipment. Uh, he, it turns out he did have a lot of jump experience, um, and he also requested specific flight path uh, from the pilots and ask for updates where they were at and jump at a much slower speed. And, and all that's possible. I know he did direct the pilot very carefully where to go. I, I had been under the impression that he had asked for four shoots when, with the ransom money, the same as, uh, as D.B. Cooper, but I may be wrong. Okay, so, all, so this leads you to make these conclusions about who he was and what kind of experience he had. So please continue. Okay, and here, so he gets his money. He, he asked for these shoots. $200,000 and $20 bills, right? Right. Uh, so he gets the money. He's got a problem with the money. The bag doesn't close up. He's got no way of attaching it to himself. So he takes one of the reserve chutes. So the bag didn't zip up. There's no way to... No, there's no way to close it. You can't cinch it. You can't zip it. It's just an open canvas bag about one foot by one foot by nine inches filled with uh, $200,000 and $20 bills. Okay. So now he's got to find a way to, to attach this money to himself. So what he does is he takes one of the reserve chutes, opens it up, and then cuts the parachute, the, the cord, out of it. So he separates the chute, the canopy, from the container. Um, so this leads me to believe that he was going to put the money in the container and then you know, clip the container to himself and jump with it. Um, turns out, I guess, the money didn't fit. So what he did is uh, he, took, uh, he, he cut two of uh, the lines, uh, two 14-foot sections of line, and then used that cord to uh, secure the money. Uh, he, he wrapped it around and around and around the bag and then made a loop, uh, some, uh, fashion some loop out of the cord and uh, then somehow in some fashion, we don't know exactly, know, attached that to himself. Um, now here's the other part that says that uh, I rule out you know, paratrooper uh, special forces. When he, when he jumped, the reserve chute he jumped with, so he put one back chute on, the remaining reserve was a dummy reserve sewn shut. It wouldn't have worked even if he tried to. Interesting. Uh, it was for classroom instruction. So when you look at the training that, that you know paratroopers go through and sports sport jumpers go through, they do very detailed checks, just like pilots of their equipment, and, and no one would have missed that. It, it was, uh, I believe, even marked in some fashion uh, that's common for classroom uh, dummies, uh, not not pupils, but <laughs> the equipment, the dummy shoot. Um, Interesting. So he wouldn't have missed that. Um, but he did because he took that with him. He left, he left the one chute in the container, uh, which you can see on the website, on the plane, and he left the other back chute uh, uh, on the plane. So there was two left on the plane. So he jumped with one main chute, his back chute, which was a good chute, would have worked, um, and then the dummy reserve, and then he had the money bag tied to him. So, so you know, you, you put all that together, and uh, I come up with a picture of you know, kind of what I said. You know, he, 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 because he knew about aircraft and aircraft operation to some degree, uh, he, he probably worked on a plane. Uh, he knew Tacoma from the air. In 1971, air travel wasn't common. So to pick out cities from the air, you had to be familiar with that. So he, was probably, he, he probably got that experience, like I said, in the military, uh, serving as a crewmate on the plane, uh, a member of the crew. And that's where he got limited uh, bailout instructions, should he ever need it. Probably a loadmaster. Um, so that's my theory on Cooper. Um, well, that's that's all very interesting, and that's information that I haven't heard before, and I, like I said, have, have looked into the case quite a bit. Now, well, that's why I'm here. N- now, the FBI, you didn't, you wouldn't have done something like rig the parachute to fail. In, no, 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 no. The, the, shoots killing him. the shoots didn't come from us. Um, in fact, in fact, I'm glad you brought that up. That is the only piece of detailed information or you know, thought process beyond the obvious that I can attribute to the Cooper case. Um, I think he requested uh, a duplicate set so that we would believe he was going to take the stewardess with him, ensuring that he would get functioning equipment. And, it, you know, of course, the, the mistake was made 
uh, you know, the, the FBI agents and the police officers that, that picked up the parachutes and transported them, you know, we didn't inspect the equipment and, and no one was a jumper. So, you know, we didn't know. It was mistakenly given to us um, by someone that hastily grabbed, you know, the chutes and handed it off to uh, the Washington State Patrol and they zoomed it off to the airport. We have some callers. Let me... I, I want to continue asking you questions of my own, but let's try to fit a couple of them in sure. here as we go. We've got Carl on our Salt Lake County line. Carl, you're on the air with uh, Agent Carr. Yeah, hi. Uh, the uh, the FBI uh, uh, put on the newspapers uh, these composite drawings. Uh, now, are these uh, pretty accurate in terms of the uh, people who actually came in contact with a hijacker? Yeah, you know, everyone uh, e- everyone that came in contact sat down with a, a, in an interview with a uh, sketch artist and you know they they went about their process developed uh, all of the parameters of the individual's face uh, they went back and constructed these uh, sketches and then they were sent back out to the field and each person uh, looked them over uh, the three stewardesses involved looked them over and uh, there were some changes made to the original ones and then once the stewardesses gave the thumbs up that this is the best representation then uh, that's what was put out to the public. Okay, and uh, and then these uh, thousand uh, sub- uh, suspects you developed, uh, uh, did they uh, fit the basic uh, description then? Well, you know, a lot of them were ruled out basically on, on uh, the physical descriptors of, of who D.B. Cooper was. Not necessarily um, the, fo- the, the sketch, but basically the physical parameters, you know, the, uh, the dark complexion or the swarthy, Olive skin complexion. Well, if your suspect's fair skinned, you know, and he, they weren't solely ruled out on that, but uh, you know, that's that's one tick. You know, yeah. okay, against this person, if they were five seven as opposed to, you know, what was reported as five ten to six one, uh, you know, there's another tick that hey, maybe this isn't the right person. If they had blue eyes, well, we're pretty sure D.B. Cooper had brown eyes, um, so you know, you can rule that off. Uh, yeah. So you know, a lot of the suspects are ruled because they just don't even closely fit. The physical criteria. Yeah, I mean, uh, since the FBI, uh, you know, has this belief that the man may have been killed in the uh, in the jump, or you know, when he hit the ground, uh, did uh, did the FBI uh, conduct a uh, search with uh, you know among the uh, missing person reports? Well, you know, you, you look at the databases back then. You know, it was long before the time of computers, so it's it's much easier to to connect the dots as far as missing persons go. Um, uh, so there, there, there was, you know, of course, an effort at, at uh, missing persons databases, but they just simply really didn't exist back at that point in time. So it would have been, you know, individual sheriff departments that collected the data, and, and someone having to do that. Well, you know, it's probably I, I couldn't even guess how many sheriff departments there are in the United States, but I would imagine it's uh, well, well into the thousands. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, is it possible that, uh, you know, when the hijacker got on the plane, he could have uh, changed his appearance, like uh, wearing a wig or, or uh, you know, maybe uh, wearing uh, uh, these uh, thick-soled shoes to, you know, make it appear he's, he might be taller or maybe he co- colored his hair a different color? Uh, is that uh, all possible? You know, it, all that is possible, but when you look at uh, how much time, especially Tina Mucklow spent, with a hijacker shoulder to shoulder with him, uh, you know, and, and you can try these experiments yourself. You know, go ahead and, and put some makeup on your skin if you're fair skinned, and put enough on to make you swarthy, <laughs> and then have someone sit next to you. Right. Well, you're going to see that makeup. It's going to be pancaked on you. Uh-huh. Same thing with a wig. You know, wigs are very unnatural, especially back in 1971. So if someone was wearing a wig, it's going to be very noticeable. Right. Um, you yeah. Know. Now, uh, w- what seat uh, was he sitting in before he, uh, you know, he hijacked the plane? <laughs> he was sitting in the very back, and, and you know, uh, I don't have the file in front of me, so I, I yeah. Was he that. sitting next to somebody else with whom he had a uh, conversation? Uh, no, he was sitting all by himself in a, in a row of three, and oh. you know, ultimately, you know, Flo Schaffner sat by him originally, and then Tina Mucklow spent the rest of the flight. Uh, you know, what him. what type of firearm uh, did he have? No firearm. He had a grenade. Uh, no grenade. He had uh, opened up his uh, briefcase, and, and there was um, either dynamite or road flares in there. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, well, but, yeah, uh, interesting case. Uh, yeah, I, I wish you good luck, Agent Carr. Thank Larry, you. Carl, thanks for the call. Okay. We, we appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 
Larry, we've got another two-minute commercial break coming up here in uh, just a second. Okay. I want to throw the uh, phone numbers out one more time for listeners. 254-5855 in Salt Lake, Provo 470-5855, and August 670-5855. We'll take more uh, calls in the next segment. I want to ask you also the next segment, maybe a little bit about McCoy, Agent Carr. You say that you have a DNA profile of Cooper now. Have you? Is there a reason that Coy has never been tested his, or his DNA matched against that profile? Well, you know, we, we would have to uh, probably exhume him uh, to do that. And, yeah. you know, I can, the, the DNA just isn't powerful enough, unfortunately, to, uh, to, to do that. It's, it's only useful to exclude individuals um, because the, the possible uh, donor group is, is way too large. Oh, is that right? Right. I mean, could you test his children? Uh, no, there, there's no familial, or, uh, familial um, testing available. It's, it's, it's too weak. I see, because the, the DNA is so old. It's 35 years old, I assume, is the reason. I don't know if the age, and, and you know, I, I'm not going to say I'm a scientist. They tried to explain all this to me, and I went, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> so they told me three or four times. But, but apparently it's the sample, the size of the sample uh, is so small um, that, uh, that, that, that it's just not that powerful. We can't, you know, can't go test. You mentioned this duffel bag. You say that it couldn't be closed. Right. It couldn't be zipped. And, I, you know, I think, well, this money was found nine years later on the banks of the Columbia River. Is it possible that, you know, the bag opened while he was parachuting? Well, you know, and this is the great thing about the money. And, and in fact, when we do the analysis of it, 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 it's our most powerful part of the story or uh, the piece of evidence that tells the story. The area where that bag was, uh, or the money was found, uh, was dredged in 1974. And so there was a very large sand clay deposit that was put on that beach in 1974. So what that tells us is if that money had been placed there the night of the jump, or just shortly after the jump, or any time prior to 1974, it would not have come up um, beyond that sand uh, clay barrier. There was no, when we did the dig there, uh, kind of from an archaeological perspective, um, the, the, the uh, sediment wasn't disturbed. So there was no geological forces that pushed that money up to the surface. So that money had to have arrived at that location after 1974. There's no way it could have gotten there because if it had, before 1974, it would still be buried there under the clay. Um, the other interesting thing about the money is when you look at uh, how it was discovered, it was still discovered in bundle formation with rubber bands around it. Now, the rubber bands were brittle to the touch, but that lets us know that that money got there. Uh, when it got there, it was still bundled. And in, in talking to experts of the day uh, back then, the, uh, the money, they said the money could not have been there for more than a year. Interesting. Um, so, you know, we can pull a lot of information about what happened and what didn't happen based on the finding of that money. Yeah, Primarily, sure. that that money had been protected for, you know, the the eight, nine years that it had been um, for, for at least eight years or a year before it had been protected. And you think the only way it had been protected, it, it had to stay in, in that bag. So it was in the bag. Is right. It, when, you, when you look at the totality of the finding of the money, you know, the belief is that money had to have stayed in the bag or it would have disintegrated long before it ever hit the beach. Does that lead you to conclude that D.B. Cooper's body or at least the bag is in the bank somewhere upstream from there? Well, you know, when you look at it, uh, and, and this is where the, the analysis gets very interesting, um, you, you look at the tributaries that, that flow into the Columbia, and you look at our, our original search area, uh, there is no way, or I haven't found a way yet, uh, and I'm seeking the, the help of any hydrologists out there that would like to contact me, but I have not found a tributary that could have deposited the money uh, into the Columbia, and then, of course, it float with the uh, the current to, to its discovery location. So what that tells me is we searched the wrong area. Uh, it had to be further south and further east. Uh, Interesting. So so we can draw that conclusion from the money, which is, you know, I find it to be very exciting because that leads to a whole new area to search. Um, and, and, and the other conclusion is, you know, that uh, as soon as he jumped out of the plane, the money simply blew off of him. Um, and, and a lot of individuals that I've talked to or interviewed that have jumped at those speeds said that's the most likely, um, uh, the likely conclusion. Um, that at 200 miles an hour, the money just blew away. They said, you know, you hit the airstream, and uh, if everything's not just absolutely locked down and clipped on, it's gone. 
Okay, but you say it had to be in the bag, so the bag itself must have landed somewhere. Could an animal have dragged, perhaps, the dead body across a tributary or across the Columbia itself, and, well, and it got out that way? or right. so- Absolutely. You know, I think that um, a, a, a carcass in the Pacific Northwest is not going to last for very long uh, at all. In, in fact, I was watching a, a Discovery Show channel, and I think it was eight days on a deer carcass. The whole thing was gone. Is that right? Uh, bones and all. Um, so... You know, I'm sure that the human being wouldn't have been much different. So nine years later, the, the body's not even going to be nothing you know, bones. Right. I think the only hope is that uh, you're going to find bones, uh, and, and that would be my great hope, is that this renewed, or if we can't find a new location, that we do a search and, and we, you know, we find a femur bone somewhere. And from there, who knows? You know, great DNA analysis not only can you determine race, but uh, just a whole host of factors that really would narrow down who this person could be, and then you can go back and do some really good work on databases for missing persons. Let's go to our Ogden line. We've got a caller with a question for you. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, Agent Carr. Appreciate the topic, interesting discussion. I just, uh, I don't know if you touched on this already, but I just kind of wanted to touch on your thoughts on whether D.D. Cooper and McCoy were the same person. If not, why? And, and just a little bit of discussion there. I'm curious. Sure. You know, when... when uh, you know, when I look at it, uh, you know, of course, and, and this is information, and you, you take it and, and speculate and, and do with it what you wish. But when I look at it, I say, number one, for it to be McCoy, he had to work with someone on the ground or at least had hidden um, a vehicle somewhere. Because if you look at, uh, he, he, and you, you believe the investigation, you know, he was in Provo having Thanksgiving dinner and then was off to Vegas. Uh, so that means he would have had to bail out over the wilderness of, of southern Washington and, and drive back or drive to another airport and fly uh, to Salt Lake City uh, to be home for dinner. And when we look at Cooper, we can, we can tell Cooper had no idea where he was when he jumped. So uh, there was no coordination with the pilots. There was no flight path determined. There's more than one, one flight path, low altitude flight path out of SeaTac um, than uh, Victor 23. So, you know, if, if Cooper was working with someone on the ground and if, if he had, was McCoy, he certainly had to have had... Uh, done that, then there would have been specific information given to the pilots so that they could do the link up. So right there, you know, I say, hey, there's a huge, <laughs> a huge gap here that it, it couldn't have been McCoy. And then McCoy doesn't fit the physical characteristics of Cooper. Um, none of them, except that he's male. Uh, so you put all that together, and I say to myself, uh, I don't think it's McCoy. I don't know how it could be. Hey, we we appreciate the call, caller. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, you know, there's a lot of people that believe that uh, that McCoy was. Was Cooper Russell Callum, who's on the program, said that he thinks that McCoy went to Vegas, flew to Seattle, performed the hijacking, and got back. Possibly had the cooperation of his wife, but he says that McCoy told an inmate when he was in prison that the bag had broke while he was hijacking in the original in the original uh, DB Cooper case, and that he performed the second one only because he felt so bad about losing the money in the first one. Now, this is just hearsay. Right. This may not mean a whole lot to you, and I'm sure you hear theories like this all the time. Somebody said something that doesn't really mean a whole lot to you. But nevertheless, he did perform a, a, a very similar hijacking uh, the next time around, and I understand that D.B. Cooper passed notes to the pilot, uh, never actually met with the pilots, through the stewardess. So the stewardess was the only person that actually saw him. Right. Is that right? Yes. And we had somebody tell us once that the notes that McCoy passed to the pilots in his hijacking were word for word the same as the notes Stevie Cooper passed to the pilots in that hijacking. Is that not true? You know, again, um, and, and I would have to look, but when, when I did review the file, they, they weren't the same. They weren't the same, uh, okay. They weren't the same at all. And, and, of course, McCoy brought, I believe, a handgun on the plane. And, I, know, and then, I know he did a grenade. He had a grenade. At least that's what I was told. I believe he had both. He had oh, a grenade he? And, and a handgun. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, and he gave, you know, McCoy did, it, uh, McCoy did it the right way. Very specific instructions, very specific flight paths, uh, updating information, uh, communication with the cockpit because he had a specific location he had to bail out of. You know, Cooper didn't. You know, fly to Mexico. In, in fact, he even told the pilots, because there was a delay because the pilots were trying to find the right flight path, uh, he said, I don't care. Just go to Mexico. File fly, fly the uh, flight plan in the air. That lets me to believe, and of course, uh, oh really? When when you look at the other evidence, you know, here, here's what I think Cooper wanted to do. 
you know, he wanted the plane to take off with the air stairs down, so he wanted to bail out uh, just a few minutes after wheels up. Uh, and when it was explained to him that they couldn't take off with the air stairs locked down because the plane can get up to speed, but it can't rotate up to take off in the air with the air stairs down, so it's an impossibility. So when he found that out, he said, fine, uh, you know, we'll just have the stewardess do it right after takeoff, and then ultimately he decided he was going to do it himself. Um, but it was uh, less than five minutes after wheels up, he started trying to get the air stairs down. Interesting. And, and he had problems. They wouldn't drop. Uh, and so he tried for another 15, 20 minutes to get the air stairs down, each minute passing many, many miles away from where I believe he wanted to jump. Well, it wasn't just a few minutes after the stairs dropped that he ultimately ended up jumping. Um, so, you know, I think his original plan was get the money and bail out somewhere right around Seattle. And you say that the original search area that the FBI considered you think was wrong. Is the new search area close to cities or towns? Well, it, you know, it would be in the developed areas uh, now. Uh, back then, it, it wouldn't have been developed. Uh, but it would just be, you know, on the borders of the Washougal uh, watershed. And, and I say that all based on the finding of the money. Uh-huh. Be- because, you know, you know, again, back to the McCoy thing, and I meant to comment on this when you said that, you know, McCoy's statement that the bag ripped open when he jumped, you know, based on the finding of the money, would have been wrong because if that was the case, the money had it to float down somewhere, uh, and, and then someone had to preserve that money for many, many years uh, and then put it on the beach. And, you know, you look at it, and that's just not a, a realistic possibility. Um, that, that's all. That's interesting. It makes sense. I I find myself agreeing with what you're saying. Were there mistakes made during the investigation after the, the hijacking? Another you know, I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think to, to answer that fairly, you know, mistakes are made in every investigation um, um, because you don't have hindsight. Uh, you know, when, when you find the ultimate answer and you go backwards, then you say that's a mistake. Now, right now, I look at it and say, you know, I don't know. I mean, I can't find a mistake. Uh, as far as I know, every person that turned up as a subject uh, and that was investigated was investigated fully. You know, all the evidence was processed uh, and, and the full effort of the Bureau was put into it. So, I, I mean, I just can't find, I can't find the error. Well, Russell Callum said that the stewardess testified that Cooper was reading mag- a magazine uh, of some kind or, or fidgeting with magazines during the hijacking at some point. I think before the plane actually landed but that those magazines were never tested for fingerprints. And so he thought that there was this horrible mistake made that the magazines had never been, been tested. Do you have fingerprint evidence of any kind? You know, we do. Uh, all the cups that he touched were processed. You know, the seats were taken out of the airplane and sent back to Quantico. Um, as far as reading magazines, the stewardess, uh, I read both her statements and, and uh, Flo Schaffner's statements, uh, and, and no one. In, in her statement, stated that he was reading magazines. So I don't know where he got that information. Okay, and, and we've interviewed s- several different people, so I'm trying to remember if it was him or if it was someone else that said that. If somebody did bring that up. Apparently, it's uh, not not right. But you do have fingerprint evidence. Do you, so you have oh, yeah. fingerprints that you know are his, or you have huge samples of fingerprints, one of which you think is his. Well, you know, who knows if it's him? But we have fingerprints uh, that were lifted from areas that. He was moving about in, you know, the the drink cups. Mm-hmm. We we took those and dusted them for fingerprints, um, you know. But they, they they were discarded by the time we pulled them out. We pulled them out of a trash bin that's on the plane. Um, so you know, during the, the the course of the flight, the stewardess you know took the drink cup uh, from Cooper and, and and threw it away like she normally would, not thinking I need to preserve this as evidence. So I'm sure she her fingerprints are all over it. You know, who knows what else. Um, but the attempt was made uh, to, to recover the prints, and we did recover prints, uh, you know, from the cups, from the seat areas. Um, and, you know, like I said, full court press. I mean, the, the seats were taken out of the plane. So, okay. Well, what do you now? This this show, you know, has been listened to by people right now. It'll also be put on the internet, or other DB Cooper shows are downloaded about 800 times a month. For the people listening now, and people who will listen in the future. What do you need? Like, what information are you looking for from listeners? Uh, what can listeners do to help the FBI solve this case? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, the key thing I think that's going to come from this is, uh, again, you know, uh, I, I spoke about, uh, hey, any hydrologists listening to this, uh-huh. I'm on board with it. 
you know, I, I need their help because, like I said, the FBI is not putting resources in, into this investigation. We're simply making it public um, to see what falls from it. You know, my job isn't to investigate the D.B. Cooper case. It's already been done. Uh, my job is to ensure bank robberies don't happen in the greater Seattle area. Uh-huh. Um, so, so my hope is that, you know, people are, are going to get interested in the case from kind of a hobbyist point of view. Uh, but what they're going to bring to it is scientific knowledge and, uh, and, and equipment probably wasn't available back in 1971 Uh that uh, ultimately is going to lead to the answer. Have you gotten leads since posting this uh, two or three weeks ago? Oh, (laughs) hundreds and hundreds of emails (laughs) uh, have come in from all over the world. And so, you know, believe it or not, I I bring them home in a huge stack and I sit them by my bed and that's my night reading. Uh, (laughs) Very interesting. (laughs) Are are most of them just crazy or have you you Uh, gotten good information out of some of them? You know, I wouldn't use the word crazy, but they're... They're, they're interesting. Um, but, you know, the great thing is, is there are people willing that have specific uh, scientific backgrounds and, and, and work for companies that are willing to use their equipment to get into the investigation. Um, so, so that's exactly what we need. Well, if it's okay with you, I'll post your email address and, uh, and contact information on our website for people that uh, want to get a hold of you. Sure. And then I'll post this uh, this interview there as well. How can people get a hold of you if they have information? Well, Do you, you have an email address or you, you can just look at way? Um, you know go to Google and type in Seattle FBI okay. and uh, all of our contact information is there. So just j- just send it to the Seattle FBI office yes. as general contact uh, email or phone number. You know or if you prefer our headquarters site at fbi.gov there's links there. To, to you know, send in any tips that you may have about the D.B. Cooper case. Well, we've only got about uh, 40 seconds left in the program. Are, are there any final comments or anything you feel like we ought to know before we we wrap this up? You know, just thanks for having me on the show, and uh, you know, oh. I, I, I hope that putting these facts out there, you know, is going to help and, and get people interested, involved in it. You know, there's a whole two generations now that uh, you know probably haven't even heard of D.B. Cooper. And, and they, who knows, they may hold the key to it. Well, it sounds like you're doing a great job investigating, and it's honestly a privilege for us to have you come on. I know you're a busy guy and reading all kinds of things, dealing with all kinds of situations up there. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you being on. We'll encourage our listeners to uh, to get a hold of you, of you if they have information. Oh, thank and you. I, in, in all my discussions about the case, much of what you've said here on the air has been things I haven't heard before, so I think uh, I think it's interesting for people to hear it. Well, good. Take care of yourself. Have a good weekend, Agent Carr. Thank you again for being on the program with us. All right. Thank you.